Good morning, everyone. I'm Mark Ostergo, and I'll be your MC for today. Welcome to the third Mental Health Week live stream session for 2022. I'd like to begin by respectfully acknowledging the traditional custodians on the land of which we are speaking to you from today and on which you are learning and working from today. I'd also like to pay respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be watching today. Mental Health Week is held nationally every October to raise awareness of the importance of psychologically safe and healthy workplaces and contributes to driving behaviour and attitudinal change to reduce stigma and discrimination of mental ill health. I thank those of you who are joining us all throughout this week. In today's session, we're talking about mental health, about lived experiences, how to start the conversation, listen and connect, and from a workplace pers perspective, also talk about the prevention of suicide for at-risk industries and building capability, literacy and expertise in mental health and suicide prevention. Today's content could get a bit heavy at times and may be a trigger for some viewers. So I ask that if you do experience a, a physical or emotional reaction to any of the content you hear today, please consider employing self-care strategies that you typically find helpful. Connect with a peer or manager, contact your employee assistance service provider or regular treating health professional. Support channels and numbers will be placed in the chat box as well as on screen. I'm very pleased to introduce you to three amazing speakers today. Firstly, we have Justin Grange. Justin is a mates in construction field officer, mental health and, uh, mental health and suicide prevention advocate and lived experience speaker. Justin empowers and educates people on how to notice if someone is doing it tough how to start that conversation, listen and connect them through to services that can help. He shares his stories of his struggle, hope and well-being with the likes of Mates in Construction, Are You OK, Movember, Suicide Prevention Australia, Virgin Australia and New Zealand, BHP, Bristol, Men's Shed Australia, Queensland Rail, Pacific National, Rail Corp, Vic Rail, Adelaide Metro and a whole host of other organisations, sporting clubs and charities in Australia. Welcome today, Justin. Joining us remotely from Canberra is Connie Galati. Connie is a senior clinical psychologist with the APS Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Unit at the Australian Public Service Commission. She is the lead author of Compassionate Foundations, an upstream suicide prevention capability suite designed specifically for Australian public servants. Prior to working in the Australian Public Service, Connie worked extensively in ACT, New South Wales and WA state health services, including community and inpatient mental health and drug and alcohol services, workforce capability and specialist mental health service design. Connie has a special interest in psychological trauma and mental health in disaster settings. She has led initiatives to support the mental health and well-being of individuals and communities post disasters and emergencies. Most recently, overseeing the ACT's COVID-19 Mental Health and Wellbeing Community Program and supporting the Canberra and New South Wales South Coast communities during the 1920 bushfires. Also joining us today is Darius Boyd. Darius played rugby league at the highest level for 15 years. However, however midway through his career, after several years of mental struggle, he made the brave decision to check into a mental health facility. Darius has since been working on himself and promoting proactive mental well-being within the corporate and community spaces. He is currently studying a diploma in counselling, a certificate for an elite athlete well-being. Darius, thanks for joining us here today. There, as always, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions of our panellists. So I ask that as we work through the presentations this morning, that you please put your questions into the chat box. Given we do have a number of speakers, I ask that you please direct who you'd like that question to go to so that we can get the appropriate person to answer. I'd now like to kick off today's proceedings by inviting Justin up to share his story. Thanks, mate. Hearing that um, introduction makes me uh, look forward to hearing myself speak, actually. It's, um, it's good. Um, I, too, want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet. Pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, I also want to acknowledge the artwork that I'm wearing over here. Um, uh, it was a gift to the, the mates team from the Larrakia Nation of the Northern Territory. Um, the, the, this artwork is titled Living Longer and Living Stronger. And, and they thought there was a close correlation between what we do at Mates in Construction and, and the message of that artwork. So thankful again to the Larrakia people. 
I also want to acknowledge those on the, um, the call that, that um, have a lived or living experience of suicidality. Um, I myself have uh, uh, had a lived experience of suicidality since my first hospital admission as a 13-year-old. Um, I'm now 50, so I'll, I'll let you do the maths. I also want to acknowledge those on this call. It's Mental Health Week this week, um, but those on the call who identify as having a diagnosis of uh, mental ill health. Um, I too have a, a mental health di diagnosis of bipolar type 2. Um, I'm not defined by my diagnosis, but I, it certainly does make up a part of who I am and, and why I do what I do. Um, and what I do is, is pretty simple. I'm, I'm a plumber by trade, uh, a father of one, that's all I can afford, and uh, uh, father of two actually, uh, the second one will be a little bit upset by that, um, husband of one. Um, but uh, what we do at Mates in Construction is, is a pretty simple program. Um, uh, we were very fortunate back in 2021 to be acknowledged by the World Health Organisation as uh, the world's best practice in industry-based suicide prevention. Um, what we know in our industry is that um, uh, we, we cop a bad rap. They say that we don't talk. They say a, a lot of things about what we do in our industry. And so when Mates um, first came about in 2006, our, our, our commitment wasn't to look so much at the deficit of our industry, but some of the strengths. And it was from that strengths-based approach that we actually help people day in, day out who might be struggling with suicide alley, might be struggling with circumstances or, or even mental health. And so um, I'm, I'm going to share a little bit today about what that process is. Um, in our industry, we do, we do one thing really well. Mates helping mates is what we do. We look after each other, you know, if someone's lost their licence, we'll, we'll pick them up and drive them to work. If, if someone's moving house, we'll bring our ute. So it's, it's help offering. Now, for, for a very long time um, across the planet, uh, the way we, we talk about suicide, we, we talk about, hey, if you're struggling, if you're doing it tough, put your hand up. Now, I know firsthand how tough that is, and we, we know in our industry how tough that can be for someone to put their hand up when they're struggling. So we draw on the strengths of our industry, which is, a, a, is all about help offering. And we start to talk about how do we offer our mates help? If we know someone's going through stuff and, and, you know, it's not all about having a mental illness, sometimes circumstances just jump up and bite us. And so if we know our mate, our friend, our family member's going through some stuff, financial hardship or relationship breakdown or, you know, circumstantial sort of stuff, and then we start to notice some changes in them, they start to do things differently. You know, where, where they're quite happy or singing or dancing or whatever, and then all of a sudden they're quiet and, and, and um, withdrawn into a corner. So we start to notice some of these things. Um, you know, we start to notice uh, people, you know, doing things they don't usually do, saying stuff that they don't usually say. You know, the, you know someone who's, you know, I'm a glass half full type person, and all of a sudden, you know, what's the point? I don't even want a glass anymore. So we start to listen. We start to hear. And, and, and sometimes it's just simply our gut as well, saying, hey, you know, I, we, we, we live beside people. We work beside people. We know sometimes when someone's on, we know when they're off. And so it's about utilising all those things that we've noticed to call your mate out on it. Um, look, at, you know, in, in society, in life, we call each other out on stuff all the time. I used to be the Brisbane Broncos mascot for 20 years. And you reckon every time I was out there at Suncorp, people weren't calling me out on the team I was supporting? Believe it or not, not everyone was a Broncos fan out there. Who can believe that? But anyway, so we call each other out on stuff all the time. We call each other out on the haircuts we got. Any mullets in the room, team? You know, we call each other out on the cars we drive. We just had Bathurst and I saw very two distinct colours there at, um, at Bathurst from the supporters. So we do that daily. And so what we say, mates, is, you know, notice if your mate's going through something, you're seeing some changes. Mate, that's not like you. You're hearing some changes. That's not like you. And your gut's saying there's something going on here. Call them out on it. Mate, you're doing that. You're saying that. That's not like you. What's going on? Do what we've been taught to do in society is call each other out on the stuff we notice. It's as simple as that. And then, look, I, I'm, as I said, I'm just a dodgy old plumber from Logan. So, so I'm not here to fix. As a plumber, I fix stuff, usually the stuff I've broken. But as a mate, you know, worried about another mate. That's not my time to, to fix. And so we say we listen to understand, not listen to respond. You know, the difference between understanding and responding are two different things. So we listen to understand and, and let them justify. You know, the, there's, there's a reason why I've noticed you're doing the stuff that's not like you. 
So they're going to want to justify, you know, why they're feeling how they're feeling. And, and, and once they've told this story, we go, man, I'm, I'm really sorry. That sounds really tough. I can't imagine, you know, going through all those sort of things. So we listen to understand and we listen without judgment. Not trying to fix, not trying to solve. And then we go, man, this is, there's some amazing people out there that, that, you know, let's hook you up with someone that can actually help you right now. Maybe strategize to get you through what you're going through. Maybe a, a counsellor, you know, um, call the mate's helpline. We can call Lifeline, Beyond Blue. So many different services out there. And then we've got Connie. I'm looking forward to hearing Connie very shortly. So we've got so many amazing people that we can connect them to. And, and that's what we do. We don't solve that problem. We connect them to the help that is available. And, and, uh, and uh, the little catch cry in my head is, you know, nothing about me without me. So I, I offer up some suggestions, but I let them make the choice. Because at the end of the day, when someone makes that choice on where that help's going to come from, they're more likely to follow through with that help. And so then, then we, we play the mate's test. We, you know, we, we don't go, here's a number, good luck with that. We go, how about I make the call for you? My boss did that for me. I'm here today because a bloke said, hey, I don't know what to do, but I can make a call and I'll do it with you in the room. And so that's what we encourage you to do, you know, um, notice stuff, you know, get... Have, listen with, without judgment listen to understand and then encourage that action and then, then we, we always check in you know how did that go for you did it work it was, I've been on many a construction site I've talked to many people I said oh I tried that once no nah. but we don't throw the baby out with the bath or I've got another saying you know if I have a bad pizza I don't stop eating pizza I go to a different pizza shop and so what we say here is fair dinkum, you know, if that didn't work. I, I've been under counselling for over 33 years myself and not every counsellor that I've seen has been the right fit for me. So we try something different. We check in and we, 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 we encourage that if that is working. But if it's not, let's try and find something else for you. That's what I want my mates to do for me and that's what I like to do for uh, my mates as well. So those are, those are the four steps that, that we go through day in, day out. That, that's, um, that's keeping people on the planet, but more importantly, keeping families together, keeping, keeping this, this process going. Now, as I said, I have a mental illness. So one of the, the, the things that, um, that brings me joy is my family. I absolutely love my girls and my, my wife. Um, um, but another thing that, that, that's been keeping me well of late is, is um, poetry. And, and so I've, I, I've been writing poems for about um, two years now. And, and one of the poems I've written is, is basically all about why I do what I do and, and what the steps are. So I'm going to pass it on to you now. And it's called Why. Some people often ask me, some people even stare and ask me, what's the deal, my mate? Why is it that you care? Well, I tell them plain and simple because it's all I've got to give. I'm doing this for my mate who's struggling with life to live. I'm doing this for the champion whose relationship's gone bust. I'm doing this for the legend whose bread's run out of crust. You see, we all from time to time fall down when life gets tough. We stomp our feet and smash our fists and say, enough's enough. But that's the time to notice, time to activate and take a stand. That's the time to shine, my friend, and lift your mate up by the hand. Ten seconds of courage is all it takes to help your brother out. To say you've noticed changes, mate, what's that all about? Then listen with understanding, ain't no room for judgment here. Next, encourage action. Share that load and show your care. For I know too well that heartache. I've trod that rocky path. I've lost too many mates and kin. I know the aftermath. So that is why I care, my friend. That is why I talk. To keep my brothers on the planet, I do my best to walk the walk. Don't have a lot to offer, no real smarts to make a mark. But I've got two flame and floppy ears my large marshmallow heart to all who've been impacted to those with tear-stained eyes a virtual hug i send your way please know the sun will rise so to you my mate my friend my pal here's a challenge just for you do what you can with your two hands you may just help a few that's the message of mates that's my heart that's my passion that's my purpose every single one of us can make a difference by noticing the people in our circle Every one of us can reach someone. So who will you reach today? Who will you check in on today? Who will you make a difference with and connect today? Thanks for that. Cheers, Dave. Justin, 
Thank you so much for sharing those tips to have those kind of check-in conversations. You know, I definitely took uh, some things from those, uh, from that, uh, I guess, those tips. You know, that ability to call people out and, and you know, ask the question, notice those differences and, and notice those changes in behaviour. Listening to understand, which is such a tough skill. I know, like I, uh, I spent six years at uni learning how to listen, and my wife tells me every day that I don't. So I, I think you know it's such an important thing to be present with people, connecting them in uh, with the appropriate services and, and support, and checking in on them and making sure it's working. I think really helpful tips, and uh, to put that all into an amazing piece of poetry is absolutely phenomenal. Thank you so much. Um, we're now going to hand over to Connie, who is joining us virtually from Canberra. Connie is going to talk to us about the Australian Public Service uh, Suicide Prevention Framework and the great work that she's been doing in this space. Welcome this morning, Connie. Thank you for the warm welcome. It's a real pleasure to be here. So as Mark said, I'll be sharing some insights about the development of a suicide prevention capability initiative and some of the broader work our unit is leading to build the mental health capability of the Australian Public Service. So Compassionate Foundations is the Australian Public Services Suicide Prevention e-learning program. It was authored by our unit specifically for staff working in government. The main catalyst for the development of this program came from the final advice from the then National Suicide Prevention Advisor. She called out the need to increase the suicide prevention capability of the public sector workforce. And as part of this advice, 3,000 people with a lived and living experience of suicidal distress, attempts and bereavement gave their insights into what that capability should look like. They spoke about the need to build compassionate and connected communities who are equipped and able to respond to early signs of distress. With these principles in mind, suicide prevention becomes a skill set for everyone not just for clinical or frontline workers. So we took this community perspective and applied it to the development of compassionate foundations in the understanding that our APS workplaces can play a significant role in providing a touchstone of connection and a sense of belonging that may in fact reduce suicidal distress for people. But despite the program being branded as suicide prevention, it offers so much more. We have six modules focused on core skills and concepts that promote understanding of trauma-informed engagement, psychological and suicidal distress, compassion and connection, as well as First Nations social and emotional well-being. With the understanding that one of the key drivers of suicide is disconnection, the program takes an early intervention approach by focusing on the relational investments we can make before distress occurs, not only in the workplace, but also in our personal lives. All those things that Justin mentioned in his talk, uh, noticing, listening, connecting, and if needed, providing that warm referral onwards. Our program was released in February of this year and our unit is supporting APS agencies to personalise their rollout to their individual workforces. Uh, we've had a lot of positive feedback. Participants have very much appreciated the program's broad applicability and appeal. They've told us that the program is highly relevant to every single APS worker. One of the key pieces of feedback we're receiving is related to the program's ability to convey complex information in simple yet effective ways. So let's see what we mean by that. I'd like to show you an example of a concept featured in the program. It's called Bid for Connection and is fundamentally about those micro investments we can make uh, in our relationships in order to keep connected. Psychologist Dr. John Gottman describes a concept known as turn towards instead of away. He found one thing that people with more healthy, more connected relationships did better. They tuned in to bids for connection. So what is a bid for connection? A bid for connection is any attempt made towards another person where you are seeking a positive connection. For the most part, these bids are really simple. 
like a smile, a sigh, showing interest, or asking for help. Recognising a bid and turning towards it opens the door for meaningful connection. If we miss a bid, we end up turning away from the chance to connect. If we constantly miss the bids offered to us, it may mean that people stop trying to connect. It comes back to the idea that to pay attention means we care. We all want to feel valued and heard. Of course, there's always going to be those days where we're not able to tune in as much. But by learning to tune in and turn towards bids for connection, we can create working relationships that are healthier, respectful, attentive, trusting, and more collaborative. I still get shivers when I watch that. Uh, one thing we noticed about suicide prevention is this topic makes a lot of people nervous. Generally, we found this is because people don't want to do the wrong thing. Um, and there's this idea that it's better to do nothing than to do harm. But unfortunately, what we know is avoiding the topic is also unhelpful and potentially harmful. So we looked at Compassionate Foundations as a change initiative for the APS. And with that in mind, I have two specific strategies to share with you that we implemented to help address this uncertainty. The first is leveraging the wisdom of lived experience. Each of our six modules features a five minute video that shares the stories of eight people with a lived experience of suicidal distress. The stories were edited together by a professional story editor to emphasise key learnings for the, the specific module. While these living wisdoms may be difficult to hear at times, these very real, very human stories provide a bridge for people to foster a personal connection to the content and build empathy. This in turn helps participants consolidate their learnings and to update their thoughts, feelings and behaviour about suicide prevention. And we're finding that participants agree. The Living Wisdom videos are by far considered the most compelling aspect of the program, creating that lasting impression that we're after well after the program is completed. We are finding that the wisdom is translating into the belief that we all have a role to play in suicide prevention. The second strategy related to how the program may be perceived by staff and agencies. So one of the early challenges we identified was the need to sell suicide prevention to an industry that for the most part was not asso traditionally associated with suicide prevention. And that kind of makes sense, you know, unless you work in a health related industry or high risk industry or have a lived experience, you may not have considered that you or your workplace has a role to play in suicide prevention. Our strategy for motivating staff engagement was informed by a social identity perspective. This perspective looks beyond the individual drivers of behaviour change and focuses on how groups shape our behaviour. We feel we're a part of the group when we have a shared connection, values, vision and norms. When we strongly identify with a group's identity, we are more likely to act in ways that achieve the group's desired goals and vision. So for this initiative, we needed to introduce a new vision to our APS workforce, one where staff believe that they all had a role to play in suicide prevention. To do this, we needed to identify the social identity that would motivate staff. So during the program's development, we convened a group of APS staff and asked, what makes up a public servant community? And there was the answer in the question. What drives many people to become public servants is our service to people, to our communities. Thus, the lens in which suicide prevention would become everyone's business was to identify as being a member of a community, whatever that community is. This community perspective is heavily promoted in the content of the course and its promotion. And in naming this community identity for our staff, we're empowering our workforce to be able to shift their thinking and act in a space where previously they either didn't act, didn't feel capable to act, or were permitted to act. 
So our unit wants to support the AEPS to build their suicide prevention capability and in doing so, invest in building a suicide prevention culture. As we said, as I said, a culture where everyone in the APS believes they have a role to play in suicide prevention and can go on to skillfully act to support someone. But we all know that training courses alone are not a panacea for a culture to change. We cannot focus on individual capability to the exclusion of collective capability and the required organisational enablers. One of the key functions of our team is to support federal government agencies to build their mental health and suicide prevention capability by aligning their practices to the APS mental health capability framework. The framework represents an evidence-informed and systems-based approach to building capability. It was developed following an extensive review into the APS workforce mental health capability. And this review included over 16,000 APS staff, as well as consultation with academic experts. The framework is designed to provide an overarching APS architecture that agencies can build from to strengthen their capability while remaining flexible and adaptable to their agency specific needs. And so in this sense, we are promoting a one APS approach, but not a one size fits all approach. As you can see, the framework is underpinned by six domains. And as a systems based approach, what this means is an investment in each of these domains is what will drive a transformation of practice. Finally, as the circle represents, this is a continuous improvement approach with the level of investment made in each of the domains expected to change over time. And this depends on an agency's level of maturity, their psychosocial risk profile, any and any organisational priorities in any given improvement cycle. So why take a systems-based approach to building workforce mental health and suicide prevention capability? In practice, what we're saying is that we can't build true capability by simply applying a mental health literacy course in isolation. In having a framework, agencies can better assess and understand the needs of their workforce. This is critical because if we really want to derive behavioural change, we also need to consider things like job design, psychosocial role-based challenges, evaluation of initiatives, as well as consider recovery pathways back into work. It's the systems-based approach and the continual systematic monitoring of our maturity of practice against the domains that supports the development of a robust mental health system within our workplaces. Using Compassionate Foundations as an example, we didn't release and forget the program. We looked closely at implementation science and how we can best support agencies to embed the required enablers to support staff to deploy their new learnt skills. These enablers will differ agency to agency, but could include anything from policies and procedures related to responding to staff vulnerable to suicide, to creating safe spaces for conversations about mental health wellbeing and suicide prevention. Our unit recently facilitated structured conversations with some of our teams where the focus has been discussing how that particular team would like to personalise how they will implement the skills for their group. And just like sometimes you need someone to accompany you on a walk in order to motivate you to go, so too can putting the onus on a group or a team make this change feel more achievable. In driving a culture change and capability shifts, our experience has found that staff and agencies need practical tools that give people understanding and direction. By providing a roadmap via the capability framework and simplifying complex information into tangible actions, our unit is supporting agencies to look at and invest in the whole picture. Culture change, though, is a long road. It requires continuous review, ongoing momentum and investment from staff and leaders at all levels. It's about finding ways to lean into the complexity and being creative with the solutions. So that brings me to the end 
I do want to acknowledge there is a lot more depth to some of the approaches I've discussed today. And so if you're interested in knowing more, please don't hesitate to reach out to our unit. Our email address is on the screen, as well as a QR code to our webpage. And I hope that brief insight into our workplace suicide prevention journey helps those of you listening with your own. Thank you. Connie, thanks so much for sharing the, the great work that's being done there for the Australian Public Service. You know, a couple of things that really stuck out for me was the, the inclusion of, of lived experience in the training and, and those stories of people's uh, experiences in the past. Um, the, the fact that, uh, you know, you've really drawn on that what's in it for me piece and, and that connection with the, the sense of community. And, and to me, that really, you know, I kind of got shivers listening to that around why are we doing this and, and actually the criticality and the importance of it from a, a, an industry perspective. And, and I think the other thing that really stuck out for me was that it, whilst, you know, raising mental health literacy and, and capability is important, it's only one piece of the puzzle and, and that it has to sit within a, a broader systems-based approach and really looking at how other aspects of the, the work uh, is designed. And, and I think that nests quite nicely with Mental Health Week and the, the upcoming release of the Code of Practice in Queensland for Psychosocial Risk Management. So thank you so much for those insights. Um, I would now like to take the opportunity to welcome Darius to the stage to talk about his experiences and share his story. Welcome, Darius. Uh, thank you. Nice to be here this morning uh, in the middle of Mental Health Week and um, share the stage with some you know, great uh, speakers in Justin and Connie as well. Uh, this morning I just want to talk a little bit about uh, my journey, my lived experience uh, with my own mental health, uh, mental illness, uh, and then just some I guess, risk factors we need to be mindful of, look out for, uh, and then some you know, important and uh, effective self-care strategies that we can do uh, in our everyday lives to make sure that you know, we're being the best versions of ourselves and living a happy and healthy lifestyle. Uh, so a bit about my journey, I guess. Um, born and raised at the Gold Coast, um, only child growing up, um, not a lot of family support around. Um, never met my father. Um, uncle and grandfather passed away uh, at an early age. So I guess for me, not having those uh, father figures, um, role models, mentors, um, people in my life that you know uh, are really, really important uh, to give you those uh, foundations growing up. Uh, it's something that I really, really struggle with in my later teens and in my early. Uh, adult years, um, but I made it work. You know, my mum and my grandmother did a great job. Uh, but when I was 15, my mum was diagnosed with major depression. So for me, it's something that uh, tw almost 20 years ago now, it was took a time for me to really understand and comprehend her challenges and what she was going through. Um, but it wasn't until I went through my own mental health journey that I re could really realise the challenges she was facing and uh, be there and help her with some support. Uh, so after that, 2014, uh, I checked myself into a mental health facility. Uh, I think from the years of challenges through my childhood and some things I hadn't really dealt with, uh, I needed to put my hand up and get professional help. You know, for me, it was something that um, I'd been seeing a psychologist and a counsellor for two, three years previous, but uh, in the amongst of my busy schedule, um, you know, an hour a month to talk about, in my mind, 10 different challenges I was going through, uh, I really needed some professional help. I needed to take a, you know, a break out of my life. So I checked myself into a mental health facility. Um, it was one of the best decisions I've ever made. I did it at 27 years of age. I wish I did it when I was 17. Um, but I learned so many different things there and some of the things that Justin and Connie have already mentioned. Um, but my life has really, really turned around and uh, that's my goal and passion, I guess, moving forward, giving me a drive and a purpose to hopefully uh, be able to change the lives of others and, and, and give that meaning and purpose uh, into others and fulfill their lives in a way that it should be fulfilled. Uh, so for me, something that is really, really was challenging, uh, but I got a lot out of and something that I've been able to move forward and, and be really, really proud of moving forward since. Uh, so just, to, I guess, to talk on a little bit about some risk factors, some things that I was going through and some things to look out for. Um, you know, risk factors such as, you know, loss of job, financial hardship, um, trauma, loss of loved ones, um, bullying, um, social media today is very, very present and a hard thing that we have to deal with. A lot of different risk factors, a lot of things that we go through you know, in daily, weekly life that... Uh, we're all going to have to um, comprehend, understand, and have some different ways we can move forward through them as well. But I guess on the point of that is, uh, with those risk factors becomes also comes with signs and symptoms. So obviously these are big you know, life events, some of these things, different transi transitions and challenges in life. Uh, but what some signs and symptoms that we might see, and I know Justin mentioned a lot of those. Uh, things like loss of appetite, you know, changes in mood, 
uh, poor concentration, uh, lack of motivation, um, isolation, withdrawal from friends and activities. A lot of different signs, symptoms and things to look out for. So when some of these risk factors do come along, um, these are some of the signs and symptoms you might see. Uh, for myself personally, uh, being a rugby league player and being playing on the national stage, um, your performance was critiqued at the highest level uh, and that really was something that I had found challenging to deal with. Um, I decided to isolate myself, wasn't spending as much time with family and friends, wasn't connecting, uh, I was reading you know, social media and mainstream media as well, all these different things that were leading to my uh, mental well-being not being the way it, where it should be and putting my, myself in a space that I needed to get some professional help. So there's some, some risk factors, some signs and symptoms that you might see to look out for and be mindful of as well. Uh, so on that, there's some strategies. So what are some strategies that you can do to prevent or be proactive around um, some of those risk factors to make sure that you're building up a really good space that then when these do challenges do arise, that um, you're well equipped to deal with them and you're bouncing back to be the best version of yourself as quickly as possible. Um, so I always talk about five different strategies, uh, things that I learned in a mental health facility, things that I've worked on uh, that really, really helped me and have really, really helped me moving forward that I've implemented not just in the facility but out of as well. So the first one was gratitude. So writing three things down you're grateful for each and every day and doing that for at least three weeks, talking about creating a habit, breaking a habit, you know, writing a th things down that you're grateful for can really, really help you achieve that. It might be turning your, your mindset from maybe negative, confused, maybe a fixed mindset um, into really a growth mindset and a positive outlook. So you know, writing a gratitude uh, journal, uh, even writing a gratitude letter to someone that's been really, really impactful in your life um, can really, really be beneficial for you. Uh, so practicing gratitude is a great strategy. Now the next one, and Con Connie mentioned it, was empathy. So that was a big one for me. Knowing you're a good person, feeling good inside, having a good heart. Um, you could call it compassion, uh, meaning and purpose. There's different ways you can, you can frame it. But you know, doing something for somebody else gives you a really, really good feeling inside. And uh, it's something that I want to achieve, um, not just in the facility, but moving forward um, past that as well. Something I want to implement. That might be things like um, charitable giving, random acts of kindness, volunteering, uh, even as f just buying your friend a coffee, um, asking your mate if they're okay, uh, merging traffic as long as they give you a wave back, uh, but make sure you know, you're merging traffic. Little ways you can just show a gesture to somebody else is a really, really good strategy. And like I said, not just for um, what you're doing for them and helping them, um, but just as important as helping yourself in internal inside as well. So empathy, meaning and purpose, compassion is a great strategy. The next one, support. That's something that I really had to grow my support network, how healthy relationships, um, something for me growing up, lost a lot of my family support from different challenges. Um, so I really had to grow my support network. Um, it can be mentors, you know, father figures, role models. It might be you know, guidance counsellors. It might be work colleagues. And it might be professional help too, psychologists, counsellors, mindset coaches, um, just people you can trust and count on. Like I said, for me, it's something that I had to do. I had to really grow my support network. Um, and I really feel like in a really great space now. I don't have uh, mum and dad and those, some, some of those people around to be my support network. Uh, but I would grow those people and different people I've really looked up to and respected and have my best interests at heart. So if you have a similar situation to me, situ similar story, uh, then may maybe you need to grow your support network and look out for some of those people. And like I said, uh, professional support can definitely be some of those as well. Next one's exercise. You know, for me personally, as an athlete for 15 years, I probably took exercise for granted. Uh, but exercise doesn't have to be playing a team sport. You know, it can be as simple as uh, walking the dog, you know, going to walk down to get local coffee. It might be parking at work and just, you know, parking a little bit further and walking to work. It might be taking the stairs instead of a lift. So there's some different ways that you can practice and, and get your steps moving and, and, and practice exercise. Um, I'm retired now from rugby league, so uh, I don't get paid to exercise anymore. So exercise is definitely part of my strategy moving forward as uh, my over overall well-being plan and being the best version of myself. And um, exercise is another great strategy as well. And then the last one's mindfulness. You know, when I was in the facility, um, it was in Sydney, you know, we work, worked on uh, yoga, meditation, uh, breath work. Uh, there's a lot of apps in the app store that you can get that have a lot of these different types of training and things that you can implement. Uh, but mindfulness is just there to be, you know, remind yourself to get back in the present moment and the here and now. Focus on the task at hand. Sometimes you know, in life when we have stress and pressure, whether at work or at home, um, we're always uh, preoccupied with those, those thoughts and feelings and emotions. So sometimes practice some, some mindfulness strategies can really just get you back into the here and now and in the present moment. So those five things, those are some of the things that I practiced and, and worked on in the facility. Uh, but just as importantly, uh, I had to work on them on the outside when I left the facility as well. Because uh, understanding those strategies are really, really important. 
Um, but be able to implement them into your daily, weekly, monthly routine. Uh, and then amongst your know, work, life, and everything else we have going on is really the, the art of those strategies. Uh, so the last part of that, I guess, was we talked about an action plan. Um, so when I left the facility, uh, what's my action plan? What do I want to achieve when I left? Um, three years, five years, um, tomorrow. What were what, what some of the strategies I wanted to implement and how I was going to do that moving forward? And we worked on three things. There's a well-being goal, a family goal, and a work goal. Uh, so my well-being goal, to work on some of those strategies, the first three in particular for me, uh, around gratitude, uh, empathy, and my support network. I really needed help with those main ones in particular. I really needed to grow them and move and work, work towards them, and that's something that I did. Uh, my next thing was my work goal. Um, what was my work goal? Uh, originally, it was not to return to rugby league. You know, for me at the time, rugby league was part of my undoing, it was part of the challenge, uh, high-pressure situation that wasn't really doing me justice. I had rugby league as number one, and family and friendships and everything else number two. And obviously, that's the wrong way to have things. So I needed to have a break from rugby league, a break from work, uh, refocus, work on some of the strategies and things I've learnt to, and to implement them and hopefully move forward. And then when I could return to work and rugby league, that hopefully I'd be more grounded away from it so I could hopefully be a better performer on the footy field. And then the last one was uh, my family goal. So connecting with my family. I lost con contact with my mother for eight years, like I said earlier, uh, understanding her challenges. Uh, when I was a 15-year-old boy, I really didn't understand, uh, really come, become closed off, quite resentful, anger, sadness, a lot of different emotions, and, uh, but I really needed my mum back in my life. I needed to reconnect with her. It was one of my biggest goals, leaving the clinic around family, was reconnect with my mum, uh, understanding her challenges, being part of her life again, and I guess we're going to close that chapter in my mind to really have my mum and my family back, and that was one of my other goals as well. Uh, so those are some of the goals that I had to work on, a bit of an action plan you know, for yourself. You know, having plans, having things written down is ways you can achieve them and it helps you um, keep yourself on focus and on point to what you want to achieve and where you want to move forward as well. And then lastly, just some other great resources. You can get some you know, great information and do some great things in the mental health and wellbeing space. So these are only a select few, uh, but you know, mental health first aid training, a lot of training and awareness around mental illness, mental health, signs and symptoms, how to run a conversation, uh, are you okay, Dave? We all heard of that before. Obviously, a lot, of a lot of different events and the different things that are going on. You know, live and do a lot, a lot of stuff around merchandise and other great things, raise, raising awareness and school-based programs as well. Uh, you know, Lifeline Beyond Blue, Black Dog. Now, a couple other ones where you can get a lot of information, professional support. Uh, there's lived experience, there's forums. Um, there's different ways you can get support and reach out. Uh, and leaving you on this note, I guess, is that for me, uh, the best thing I ever did was to reach out, ask for help, put my hand up to get some professional help. Um, it was one of the best things I ever did. My life changed for the better so much moving forward, um, and I urge you to do the same. Thank you. Darius, thank you so much for your insights and sharing your story, uh, both, uh, I guess, some of the challenges and risk factors that you faced uh, and also your journey uh, in terms of recovery and, and the five key things that you found really beneficial. And, and I think, you know, for me, what really stuck out there was not necessarily the, the strategies, but more the, the challenges of implementation when we're busy and, and really ensuring that we maintain those practices and those strategies and, and have that solid plan in place to, to ensure that we're able to to, to maintain that over a period of time. So thank you very much for, for sharing that with the, the audience. We're now going to the Q&A, and, and we've got a number of questions that have come through the chat already. But if you do have more, please feel free to drop them in the chat, and we'll do our best to, to get through all the questions this morning. So the first question has come through for Justin, and uh, it's probably no surprise that the audience absolutely loved your poem, Justin. A and the, the audience is really keen to understand, uh, A, are they able to access that and if they are where where or how can they do so yeah look um it, it, it's a free you know i i uh, do a week a palm a week um you can see them up on linkedin i will flick through the um the words and everything for um for the team to pass out to the networks from there but yeah just um I've got my little YouTube channel and stuff like that. I think my mum likes them, so if you want to be the second person to like it, I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, an anywhere on uh, on LinkedIn, by all means, hook up and, um, and and follow them through that as well. Fantastic. So th there's a range of different opportunities for people to, to get in and follow you and, and see that and yep. kind of listen to that more thoroughly and, and the new material that comes out as well. 
Um, the, the next question is for Connie from one of the audience members. And uh, the, the question is that, you know, recognition that this is great work being done at the federal level, but is there any intent or plan to share it across some of the, the state-based agencies or, or governments? We are very happy to share our resources. Um, unfortunately, what we can't do, we're not funded to support you with the implementation of those resources, but feel free to reach out. Um, we are in the business of, of, of wanting to share what we have. So yes, happy to share, um, reach out to us. Fantastic. That's great to know, Connie. And look, the, the next question is for you as well, and it, it's coming from Donna. And it, I guess in the, the recognition that our uh, servicemen and women, whether that's Air Force, Navy or Army, may face a, a higher risk of suicide, um, and wondering whether the, the APS framework extends to those three services. So we... <sighs> As I mentioned, the framework was developed with input from um, a lot of our agencies, a lot of our staff. Um, the, ag the framework is not meant to kind of dictate what agencies have to do. It really is what underpins their path forward. So it is very much applicable to every agency, including um, uh perhaps Defence or Veterans Affairs, if that's what you're speaking to. Um, as I mentioned, the framework is, is the roadmap and the agency can apply their specific initiatives, address their specific psychosocial risks. All the framework is doing is just making sure that that investment is happening across all those domains and making sure that we're enhancing the governance, the evaluation of those initiatives. Um, one of the things, and this is not specific to um, uh, any specific agency, but some things that are really common across many organisations is we get really excited, we implement an initiative and we forget to evaluate it. We forget to check in with the staff to see, is this actually working? Is this doing what we want it to do? So some of the things that the framework does is actually just gives us a bit of a checklist and making sure that all the good intention that we have is actually aligned to evidence and, base, and best practice. So definitely applicable um, and very flexible. Fantastic. So, you know, recognising that the, the framework is just that. It, it's not the implementation or the initiatives, but it is that guiding document, uh, what, I guess, with how different agencies may then apply that. And, and, you know, there are a number of federal agencies that may be in higher risk roles. It could be the Australian Federal Police, uh, certain parts of Home Affairs, or, or whether it's Defence, and, and recognising how those materials, those resources, and, and those different things can be applied to, to those different work environments and those situations. And, and look, Donna, being an, an ex-Army psychologist myself, I, I know that there's been a whole bunch of initiatives done within Defence uh, to, to, I guess, recognising the risk of the higher suicide rates and, and looking at suicide prevention. Um, the, the next question is from Nicole, and it, it's directed to you, Justin. Um, and, and it's wanting to draw on your experience, so I guess, on visiting the, the multiple workplaces within the construction industry over the years. And, and I guess, what are some of the changes that you may have noticed within respect to, to mental health and mental ill health within those workplaces? Yeah, I, I think acceptance is probably the big, big key here. Um, early days of mates, um, we, we would have to knock hard on doors and get a lot of doors slammed in our face. Um, these days we, we are under the pump for requests. Um, the, 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 the sites and workplaces that are wanting to adopt um, some sort of program around, around mental health and suicide prevention um, is just mind-blowing at the moment and um, there's a th real thirst and hunger um, to want to improve the space, to want to shift the culture. Um, I, it just, just two weeks ago I was having a arm with a school and I was just over, overwhelmed by the, the mental health um, literacy of grade one students. So to me, the conversation is happening. Yeah, we've got a long way to go, uh, but, but to see a grade one student be able to articulate some of those um, you know, important things that we do for our own mental health and well-being, like Darius was saying and Connie was saying, is, is just um, really breathtaking and, and really encouraging to see, hey, yeah, we are making a difference. We've still got a long way to go, um, but, but it's looking a lot better than what it was. 
Awesome. So it sounds like there's been a, a lot more openness in, mm. in terms of raising awareness and, and driving that mental health literacy uh, across the construction industry and to the point where it sounds like you're a little bit overwhelmed at the moment with the yeah. number of requests <laughs> that are coming through, which is fantastic. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the next question is for Darius, and, and it's coming from Jessica. And I think you know it's a great question. And, and you, you spoke about risk factors, and we know that transition uh, within work can be a, a risk factor for multiple people. And, and the question is about your own personal experience around your transition out of full-time NRL and, and into retiring. And, and how was that for you, and how was that experience? Yeah, I think it's one of those things, I guess, that um, talked a little bit about that, about really um, separating your self-worth from you know, your job. I think that's really important, um, and that's the rugby league. Uh, it's at the highest level, and it's something you play and do since you're probably six, seven year old little little boy. Um, so being an athlete, I think, is probably at the top of that scale as far as that self worth. It's something you've done for such a long time. So to be able to really uh, separate that and uh, differentiate the two, I think, is really, really important. So to know that um, you as uh, your work, whatever you do, isn't define you as who you are. I think that's really important. So it's something that I've uh, worked towards over a long period of time, probably the last. Uh, four or five years of my sporting career to know that, make sure that hopefully that uh, I was in the best space possible when I did retire, that I had other things to go to and aspirations, dreams. And I always talk back to that meaning and purpose too. I think if you have a, find that meaning and purpose in life and sometimes that is a challenge, um, but you know, one, on one hand, rugby league was that for me uh, for such a long time. I'm very grateful for that experience. And now uh, I'm lucky enough to have fallen into another space where I'm really passionate and have something that I want to drive and focus on and, and just making sure I do differentiate that um, whatever I do at work doesn't value the person I am at home. Fantastic. And I, I think that's such really important reflections around that, that identity piece. And I, I think as humans, it is you know, really kind of normal human behaviour at times to build your identity around what you're doing. And, and so we're in the recognising the risks that can come with that when we do transition and, and really finding that, that meaning and purpose in you as an individual uh, as opposed to, to what you're doing, which yeah. is fantastic. Thank you. Um, the, the next question is to the entire panel. And, and it's in recognition that... Um, you know, suicide impacts multiple people, not just the, the person who may be considering it or, or participating in, in those behaviours. And, and so the, the question is, what support is available to the community or someone who has lost someone due to suicide? Um, maybe we'll throw over to you first, Justin. Yeah, uh, look, um, as, as tough as it is, and I think Connie referred to it, as it's not a panacea, we still are losing people and um, we will lose people. I think um, there, there's a couple of organisations, um, like if, if, if it happens in construction, we'll do what we call a post venture. So we'll, we'll go and visit a site and we'll support those um, that, that, that are really rattled or a little bit wobbly as a, as a result of what's happened. Um, but there's, a, there's another fantastic organisation called Standby, uh, they're in different parts of, um, of Queensland and around Australia as well. Um, they, they provide real um, support to family members that have been impacted um, or bereaved by um, uh, suicide or loss of someone they care about. Uh, and, and from what I understand as well, I mean that, that could be two years ago and you can still receive um, that, that support from standby. Um, there's another couple of great um, organisations around Australia that, that, that um, support people going through grief um, and things like that. So um, those, those are the ones off the top of my head and um, I've got a lot of websites and knowledge and, um, around other organisations, but um, by all means there is support out there, I think is the bottom line. Fantastic. So it sounds like there's a, a number of community-based organisations and are doing great work to, to support people. Yeah. Um, Connie, do you have any uh, additional resources or insights to that question? I think Justin has covered them all, but what I will say from a workplace perspective is that this really ties you know, when you consider what Justin has said, the other side of it in a workplace perspective is making sure that you have planned for the possibility that this may happen to one of your staff members. So do you have postvention policies and procedures in either a suicide prevention policy or a critical incident policy? Um, so these are things that um, are really helpful to start thinking about. Not only do we respond to perhaps suicidal distress in our staff, but what happens if that, that were to occur? So thinking about your postvention policies in the workplace is a real um, important factor to consider as part of your overall suicide prevention um, practice. 
great insights and, and the criticality of that post defension piece um, and, and ensuring that it's thought through as part of the holistic framework through implementation. And, and so, there, you know, so in the event that something does happen or, or that we do lose someone to suicide, that we know and what we can, I guess, go to in the workplace to support people. Um, the, the next question is for Justin from Lauren. And you spoke earlier around this idea of calling people out um, and you know, trying to get them to open up. But I, I guess the question is around, well, what happens if they don't open up? What do we do? How do we handle that? Yeah, look, I, I guess, and um, I, I think a lot of us, we, we get this question a lot. Um, I, I refer back to when I was going through some of my stuff. Um, my boss was one of those people, he didn't know really what to do, but he just kept calling me out. And um, I was a typical bloke back then going, yeah, no, I'm all right, you know, didn't Alfie? Um, yeah, no, nah, yeah, no. Nah. Um, but, but from my perspective, every time he, he called me out, every time he asked what's going on, every coffee he took me out to, it gave me a seed of hope that someone gave a rip. Now, when I was ready, I actually opened up. So in terms of the question there, it's about continue showing someone that, you, that you've noticed, that you care enough to notice and, and ask, while they might not be forthcoming, um, it's about letting them know that when they are ready, that, that they've got someone that they can go to. Um, certainly if, if it's crisis point um, and you need to make emergency phone calls, by all means do that. But I think we're, we're all pretty adept at knowing, you know, I, you're saying that, but I don't believe you. So um, I'm going to use, you know, these are all my reasons for asking. You know, it's not, not just a general conversation. I'm asking because I've got all these reasons, all this evidence loaded up over here that might suggest that you're struggling, that you are doing it tough. And, and be, you know, our intent when we're worried about someone is to do all we can to help them. So keep doing all you can to help them. Keep asking. And when they are ready, for some, for some people, you might not be their go-to. So offer up, you know, who's, who's someone that you trust that you might want to talk about this? Um, in, in mates, we've got connectors. They've got green stickers, easily identifiable. So it could be, you know, I might not be the person for you. And that's okay, but where else can we get you someone that you might be able to trust and, and might be able to feel okay to open up to? So that's our, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. So we're not shining bright lights in their face, interrogating them, telling them to open up. Yep. Um, we're continuing to demonstrate that empathy, check in with them or, or potentially ask, you know, is there someone else that you'd like to talk to? And, and I like to think about it as knocking on the door. You know, the first time you knock at the door, they might not be home, they might not answer. It might be the third or fourth time you knock yep. that they actually answer the door and, and open up. 100%. Fantastic. The, again, uh, sticking with you, Justin, the next question is from Penny, and it's asking about the, the risk of vicarious trauma in the work that you do and, and what supports are in place. Yeah, look, um, it, it's a very, you know, ex empathy is born by experience and, and we do what we do, like Darius says, you know, this gives me um, purpose, and, um, but I need to know that if I don't look after myself, uh, through some of those strategies that Darius talked about, you know, what can we do? Um, our boss refers to four buckets, our bucket of um, physical energy, our bucket of mental energy, our bucket of connection, and our bucket of spiritual, you know, all that purpose sort of thing. So for me, it's about ensuring that, yeah, I go for a walk. No longer do I do my marathons, Darius. Um, I'll, um, I'll connect with me mum and dad by Zoom or I'll connect with my family. We'll go to a movie or um, doing what I do gives me purpose. Um, but there are times, busy times like October and September when we're all pretty cooked by the, the message that we're sharing. And so um, I know for me it's about preparing for those times. And I also have a counsellor that I see monthly and we strategize. You know, I'm not always in the pickle, um, but we strategize on, on how I get through tough stuff. And so a big commitment from um, our workplace is that everyone is entitled to an employee assistance program, not only recommended, but um, not, not enforced, but, but highly recommended that, that we make sure we look after ourselves. Otherwise, we're not going to have the capacity to look after other people with what we do. So important to, um, you know, check yourself out um, before you help other people out. 
Awesome. So it sounds like a, a mix of proactive strategies there and, yeah. and engaging in those proactive supports as well uh, and, and practicing all the, the great things that, that we preach, um, yeah. but not running marathons <laughs> anymore. Come on. Um, the, the next question is more, uh, I guess, a workplace specific one. And it's looking at this concept of returning to work post experience of mental ill health or, or mental injury. Um, and, and based on, on your experiences of, of returning to work, what would be helpful in the workplace? And, and and Darius, we might go to you first, if that's okay. Yeah, I think uh, I think just um, being, uh, I suppose, safe with the way you're returning to work too. I guess was um, taking small steps first. Um, if you have coming back from a, a, ch a challenge or a mental health uh, concern, and I think also just being, um, hopefully, you have a safe space to go back to as well. So hopefully, you've built up some um, con connections and some rapport with some of the you know, people in, in your workforce and, and if not maybe there is like Justin said there's one or two that you really do um, get along with and, and, and have that trust and r rapport with that you can um, spend a bit more time with them uh, and maybe it is you know, speaking to your boss or leader about what um, days you might be able to come in can you do um, some Zooms can you work from home to start off just that initial process of you know, returning to work slowly I think is really really important but hopefully you have enough good um, quality people in that um, building and the environment and the culture is great at your workplace that you feel safe enough to return and maybe it's just in a slow space, slow way. Absolutely. So that, that gradual nature of return to work and, and doing what's uh, achievable and, and realistic. Um, but, you know, I think the critical piece there is that engagement with your workplace and, and that it is a safe space for you to return to work. Justin, any, any thoughts from your perspective? Yeah, look, uh, and again, I draw on Darius's um, uh, s wording around support. I, I, I call it my scaffolding. And so always having that safe space, but uh, more importantly, scaffolding. Um, I, I had to return to work after a, a, um, one of my uh, stints in hospital and, and understanding that there's, there's, everyone's walking on eggshells and around you. So trying to normalise um, that return to work as well as having those safe people to, that you can connect with both at work and at, at home um, and even in professional supports as well um, was a really important part. And, and for me, it was very much a step by step, very much a slow, slow and steady that uh, reintegration into what your, your usual role was. I don't call it your normal role, but um, that, that usual role that you partake in. And um, so important to have those supports and strategies and scaffolding um, prior to, to coming back. And um, I worked closely with the, the HR team um, at, at my particular um, job and, and they were really good at, at softly, softly getting me back um, to that space where I could excel at what I was doing at. Right. It sounds like it was a, a, quite a, a structured kind of return to work for you that you went through when you had to do it. And, and it sounds like the supports were in, the, in place from the workplace at, at the time as well. Um, Connie, I, I might throw over to you with that same question and just ask, is there anything within the capability framework that kind of looks at, at this challenge of uh, return to work for someone who may have experienced mental ill health or uh, suicidality? Yes. So... Um Three of the domains of the framework are actually based on the mental health continuum. So looking at what are the initiatives and the enablers that we need to embed that look at um, from prevent harm all the way down to recovery. Um, so again, we don't necessarily tell agencies what those initiatives are, but we do ask them to consider that whole continuum in terms of what um, they need to do. Um, you know, although there's a lot of things that could be done, um, we're really trying to build on some of the simple stuff. So we know some of the buffers, whether people are coming back to work after a period of mental ill health or otherwise. Um, and of course, there's individual and specific things that can be done for those things. Um, let's get the basics right. So how are you going to connect with this person? How are you going to show that you respect their autonomy while also giving options? Some of that scaffolding and support that both Darius and Justin spoke about. Um, how are you going to educate yourself to kind of understand oh, if this person is coming back after a period of major depression? Yes, I want to hear what their needs are, but what do I know about major depression? depression and how that might impact in the workplace, what might be some things that I can offer. Um, in When I was working more, uh, more in the clinical world, some of the things I would talk about with people who were returning to work 
were how can we in this space articulate what you might need and how does that then translate to a return to work plan so that's doing it from the person side but I really think that's important from an agency side not that they need to be experts in it but really just putting themselves in that person's shoes and thinking about um, for instance if a person is um, coming back after a period of major depression I wonder what their sleep is like I wonder if maybe offering those flexible hours because their sleep schedule um, is has now changed would, would be useful so again it, it's just trying to empathize and put yourself in the person's shoes but the biggest thing behind all of that is connecting and trying to kind of have those conversations in the workplace that mean it's 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 okay. So the biggest buffer um, to supporting people to return to work is connection with your with your team, with your staff, with your manager. If you've got that, that's a pretty good buffer for some of the other stuff. Again, there's individual and personalized things to do, but get the basics right, and um, that will go a long way. Fantastic. So. Uh, you know, I like to think about it at times of being human, right? If we can be empathetic and, and create that connection and, and support that person and ask those questions with that individual as the expert and what they need for their return to work journey, that's a, a really great place to start. Connie, we're going to stay with you for the next couple of questions. The, the first one is a, a really simple one. And can you please share your QR code again? Um, and there it is up on screen for our audience. So please take the, the time to snap that so you can see those resources. Uh, the next question, Connie, is do you have any examples of innovative practices in workplaces that relate to prevention and early intervention? So what have you seen agencies do and how have they actually implemented this framework in, in an innovative way? Oh, that's a really good question. And you really are asking me to go deep into my brain. Um, some of the really great things are probably going to sound a little bit boring. And the reason they're boring is um, because they're things that we know but require a lot of time and investment. So the biggest thing to do... Uh, the biggest thing that I've seen agencies take on is looking at that psychosocial risk assessment of all of their roles in their agency. That's then looking at what do we know about these roles? How can we then um, look at job design to make sure that we can either remove some of those risks or if we can't, how do we buffer those risks? Um, so when and again, not just our agencies, but organizations, you know, this investment might take 6, 12, 24 months and maybe something that has to be repeated. So although it might sound a little bit boring, the innovation is actually in how do agencies protect this time so that these assessments can occur? Because how do we know what initiatives are going to work if we don't know what the problem is. And so often we can kind of have a guess, we can have a guess and maybe they're really good educated guesses. Um, but I guess what I've learned in psychology is I need to do a thorough assessment, which then guides my treatment plan. And this is the same for agencies. We need to do assessments of what's going on uh, in all roles at all levels. And then from that, those are where our initiatives should come from. So the innovation for me is, is how do we create a culture that gives that time um, to allowing this process to occur. Um, Sorry for the, for the boring answer, but that is my, what I believe. Connie, I didn't find that answer boring at all. And I think you mentioned in your presentation that culture change is a, a long road. And I think, you know, when we think about organisations and, and workplaces coming back to those principles of assessment, strategy, intervention, evaluation, and if we can do that well, then hopefully we're going to have meaningful interventions that are going to support people in, in being mentally healthy in the workplace. Um, the, the last question to the panel is from JJ, and the, the question is around people working within the, the private sector and, and the recognition that some workplaces uh, have quite long work hours, suggesting that he, uh, JJ has a, a friend who works up to 16 hours a day. Is there any advice or anything we can do for, for those types of workplaces? Um, Justin, we'll start with you. 
Yeah, look, I, I mean, we deal with a lot, lot of um, single business tradies and um, that, that, you know, work from stupid o'clock to stupid o'clock doing quotes and invoices well into the evening. Um, we, we, we always, uh, one of our mottos is, you know, beginning with the end in mind, um, thinking about, you know, uh, what, what do I want to look like in 60 years time and, and um, how do I take the steps to get to where that end product is. I've never, never heard anyone on, um, on their deathbed saying, gee, I wished I worked longer and harder. Um, so sometimes it's about reframing what, what just is what is important to someone. Um, if you are time poor, we talk to a lot of people about you know, um, doing those things, those strategies that help keep you well. Um, sleep's a big, big part of that as well. So, um, you know, working out how you, how you include things like exercise, how you include things like activities for your brain, and um, but again, all done with the, the the single lens of you know where do I want to be? Um, I know it sounds like a big picture sort of stuff, uh, but if my pilot didn't know where he was going, then I'd be very worried. You know, so we need to have a destination in mind, and with that, try and um, look after our well-being with some of these strategies. Um, to you know, incrementally get to that that end um, de that destination, I suppose. Awesome. So for for those individuals who may be working longer hours or, or you know have high workloads, really thinking through what is it that well, where do I want to be and what's important to me yeah. and, and how do I achieve that? Yeah. Awesome. Darius. Yeah, I think just adding on to what Justin said about the sleep and diet exercise piece, but then also I think just trying to find where you can value some hobbies and interests in, into your weekly routine, you know, so if you have a long week and it's Monday to Friday, then maybe it's your, your weekends where you have hobbies and interests, golf, surfing, you know, kids, friends, family, you know, date nights, you know, all those type of things, but where can you just add those little, I suppose, um, little breakers in that, in, that, in that busy week, in that um, life of, of week spe schedule, I guess, where you can just kind of refocus, recharge and then go again. I think that's really important. I think having those hobbies, interests, you know, big weeks coming up, but I've got that thing to look forward to on Saturday or Sunday. I'll recharge, refocus, enjoy that time and then go again, you know. So I think just having those little times you can recharge is, is important as well. So planning and recovery into those, yeah. those big work weeks, fantastic. And, and Connie, any advice from your perspective? Yeah, I think Darius and Justin have um, provided a good overview about we as individuals can do. But I guess I want to remind people that there's a mutual responsibility here of the workplace and the worker. So some great ideas there about what you as an individual worker can do and are really important. But what is it that the workplace can do to buffer that? You know, that could be things related to as simple as rostering and how do you uh, run your roster so that the impact of that fatigue is is reduced. Um, again, it's not, not likely to go away altogether, but what can you do to, to reduce the impact of it? So again, really considering from an individual perspective, what can I do? But what is it that my agency organisation uh, should be doing to as much as possible protect me from, from this hazard? Because it is a hazard, uh, but it also has to be done. So it's not a all or nothing situation, um, I'd be looking at some of those workplace buffers to then enhance what you're doing as an individual. Awesome, thanks Connie. And yesterday we had a great live stream event on burnout and some of the things that workplaces can do to start mitigating that from a systemic perspective. And, and so that will be up on the WorkSafe uh, website in the coming weeks. So you can also check out some more in-depth advice there. For our panellists, we're going to round off with your top tip in 30 seconds or less. So Connie, we'll stay with you. Top tip for workplaces or for people? Ah, the top, top tip, oh, you've caught me on the spot. I would say evaluate your initiatives, check your organisational enablers and uh, yeah, evaluate your initiatives. Are they working? Are they doing what you think they're doing? Fantastic. Making sure what we're actually doing has, is into doing what we intend it to do. Uh, Darius? Yeah, I think I'd just say building connection rapport. I think building that within your organisation, workforce, whether you're the leader or the employee, I just think having that connection, that, re that trust, that rapport, uh, having a safe space to go to at work each day is really, really important. Awesome. And Justin? Yeah, look, I, I think um, kindness, practice kindness. We, we, we all go through stuff and, and that connection um, and the empathy that we've talked a lot about today is all, all around um, practicing kindness for you never know what someone's going through. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us today. In today's session, we heard as our panellists shared their perspectives and lived experiences around mental health how to start the conversation, listen and connect, 
And Connie, thank you for sharing insight into the work APS are doing around mental health and suicide prevention. A reminder, if you need support, please, uh, please consider employing the usual self-care strategies that you typically find helpful. Connect with a peer or manager. Contact your employee assistance provider or your regular treating health professional. Support channels and numbers are on the screen in the chat, or you can call Lifeline at any time on 13 11 14. Today's presentation, the recording of it, will be available on our website. Keep an eye on, out for it in the coming weeks. As we wrap up the event today, on screen is a QR code. You're invited to confidentially share insights into the preferences, barriers and drivers for your organisation in developing and implementing health and safety management systems that consider mental health and how you can engage in mental health initiatives and programs. Fantastically, you can also go into the draw to win a four-hour mental health training package for managers, which is valued at almost $1,000. So check out the website for WorkSafe for resources. You can still register for our last live stream tomorrow on diversity and inclusion, including supporting neurodiverse workers. And of course, there is an opportunity to catch up on any event recordings you may have missed throughout the week. Have a great day, everyone. And remember, work safe, home safe.